morning. It's good morning. It's May 7th, um, 2020. And uh, my name is Katie I'm with the California Appellate Law Group, and I'm immediate past chair of the Committee on Appellate Courts for the CLA's litigation section. And I'm here to interview our guest, Jorge Navarrete of the California Supreme Court. He is the administrator and clerk of the court. And this is part of the Committee on Appellate Courts series, May It Please the Court, about oral argument in COVID-19 times. So um, I would like to introduce Mr. Navarrete. Mr. Navarrete, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Navarrete has been the administrator and clerk of the California Supreme Court for almost four years. He was appointed by Chief Justice Tani Cantio Sakauye in uh, October of 2016 uh, to replace uh, Frank McGuire, a long serving clerk who was retiring. And uh, Mr. Navarrete has the, was uh, the assistant to Frank McGuire before his retirement and really earned the chief's trust and respect um, and actually began at the California Supreme Court 20 years earlier. And uh, the Chief Justice, when she appointed him, mentioned that he was a dedicated public service. He rose through the ranks, actually, uh, from the file room. Is that correct, Mr. Navarrete? That's correct, yes. I started my career here in the Supreme Court back in 1996. I uh, worked in the file room and then worked my way up through the clerk's office, through every level in the deputy clerk uh, classification. And then I was appointed by Chief Justice George back in 2009 as assistant clerk. And you have served for, I think, three chief justices at the California Supreme Court. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, I started when Chief Justice Lucas was the chief justice, then Chief Justice George, and uh, our current chief. Fantastic. Well, our current chief, Justice Cantil Sakauye, uh, really mentioned that she drew on your unique firsthand experience with every aspect of the court operations when she selected you to run the court. And also your inspiring personal story, because uh, as I understand it, you, have, you are a um, Mexican native, is that correct? That's correct. And bilingual, and you bring a, a great deal of richness and diversity, um, and I suspect uh, insight, especially now on the uh, special access to justice issues that have arisen during the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, so I, it seems that you are uniquely and perfectly positioned to help all aspects of the court through this crisis. Uh, today, I want to ask you some questions specifically about oral argument during COVID. And um, as the uh, Trade Association for California Lawyers, the California Lawyers Association is really interested in helping attorneys who um, may be a bit nervous about approaching their first remote oral argument. And uh, perhaps you can talk to us a little bit about the, the history of the court's response and how things are going so far, things that might help practitioners uh, please the court during their oral argument uh, and uh, any support that's available. Um, and what to expect in the future. So uh, let me ask you to begin with, the, uh, the shelter in place order started in California in mid-March. And um, as we go through, I just also am going to show the, um, the court's website does have a news and reference site that can give you uh, all the history of the COVID orders available on it. Um, so when the shelter in place order started, the California Supreme Court was very proactive and announced changes to its oral argument procedures right away on March 16th. Could you please describe that initial response? Correct. I uh, see it was clear that um, COVID-19 was really spreading and there was some action by our governor and even at the federal level. We um, started looking into how oral arguments is going to look like to go into remote access to allow the court to continue their operations on a daily basis. Uh, one thing was clear that we didn't want to cancel oral arguments, so we started exploring other options as to what would be the best way to continue providing oral argument in the matters that are coming up before the court. 
Now you had so already the, live streaming argument with the court in place, right? Correct. We started our live streaming back in 2016, May of 2016. That was the first session that we provided live streaming. The live streaming, it is a, it's access to the core from the public. So anyone throughout the state, around the world, can actually connect to our website uh, and be able to see the oral arguments from their office, from the school, from the home. Um, so that was a tool that we already had in place uh, to have Thank access you. to the core room for the public. Thank you. I'm going to interrupt you just for a moment to show the listeners sure. on the California Supreme Court website where they can find the oral argument information. And um, those arguments are available. You can click on there and see both the calendar and the webcasts and the timings and view, and view the arguments. As you say, that has been in place for a couple of years. And many of us really appreciate that. And um, you mentioned about being able to listen to, um, having been able to watch those arguments all around the world. Uh, even I have a colleague in Italy with whom I engage in reciprocal uh, language lessons, an attorney in Milan or new attorney in Milan, and was able to watch arguments this past week with great interest on some issues, criminal justice issues that uh, are also arising in that country. So it's a wonderful access and uh, very much appreciated, not just in California, but around the world. So on March 16th, you had though some refinement to decisions to make regarding COVID. Tell us more about that. Correct. Um, so the core issue, the order indicating that we are gonna continue with oral arguments, but we were suspending in-person oral argument. So we were not requesting the attorneys to come into the courthouse to present oral arguments. So at that point, that's when we issued the order to indicate that oral arguments will continue by remote access. Um, so we suspended all in-person oral arguments. We, at, that, at that time, we continued to, well, we were thinking about allowing the public to come into the courthouse to watch oral arguments. Um, with a very limited seating because we wanted to have seats for the press and also for the public. But at the same time, we wanted to provide the social distancing for everyone that plans or planning to attend oral argument. For that reason, we limited to only a few seats in the courtroom for the public. Mm -hmm. I have a still of the first oral argument or one of them showing now, and this was the argument in the Faust case, and uh, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, this is just a screenshot, the Supreme Court with the um, clerk there and a, a few staff people, the justices, um, uh, a, a few of the justices on the bench, and then Justice Chin, um, Justice Groban, and Justice Kruger participating remotely, uh, as well as counsel. So that's the uh, visual of that first argument. How did that go? Well, before that, I mean, that was in March 2016 uh, when we issued the first order. But then on you know, March 27, we issued a second order in regards to oral argument. In that order, we determined that it was not feasible to allow the public to come into the courthouse for the fact that we had the shelter in place. So at that point, mm -hmm. we kind of determined that no members from the public would be able to come into the courtroom to observe oral arguments. So we invited everyone to participate or actually view the oral arguments through the live streaming. Yeah. So when we came for oral arguments in April, uh, there was no one in the courtroom except for the justices that were attending oral arguments um, in person. So at that point, that was our first oral argument session through remote access by the attorneys. Justices were on the bench, but there was no members of the public or the press in the courtroom. I see. And um, do you, are you familiar with uh, how the courts of appeal are handling public access when the arguments are telephonic? Or is that something that's uh, still being worked out? I think uh, most of them are kind of in agreement or following what we have done. Uh, but I think some courts have delayed oral arguments. I'm not sure. I mean, I believe some courts have proceeded with the same uh, format we have adopted. So other ones are still exploring options, um, but I think they all kind of follow the same process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, then this, um, 
I'll show the next argument, which was this week. Here's a screenshot, not a great shot, but uh, also showing the, uh, the setup. And this is the website where one can view the arguments and also conveniently displayed on the web uh, site is the calendar along with links to the court's information and docket and description of the case, um, all available there on the webcast oral argument page. Um, can you tell us a little about the process for remote argument in the California Supreme Court now? Correct. So the moment that matter is placed on calendar, we send an email to all the attorneys that are going to be appearing on that calendar. And we send them an email with instructions as to what is the application they need to download, which we will use in Blue Jeans video conferencing. That is the application selected as the best way to pro proceed with the oral arguments. So everyone gets an email from the clerk's office with instructions what needs to be done. We also set up a test session. So we actually invite the attorneys to connect a few days before oral argument um, to test the audio, test the video, and to provide any information or ask or answer any questions they may have in regards to oral argument. So that session can go anywhere between 30 to an hour because we want to make sure that everyone has a clear view of the courtroom. They can also see and hear everyone, and at the same time that we can hear them and see them when it's time for the case to be argued. So we do provide that a few days before oral argument. And we did that back in April, we did that in April, May, and it was very successful. Um, everyone kind of felt um, that we answered all the questions they had, all the technical uh, questions they had, they were answered at that time. So by the time oral argument came, uh, they had the experience, so they, they, they had a feeling for what it was gonna be like for oral argument. Well, that's wonderful. And that may be very well why these arguments seem to be running so smoothly. Um, how is the time managed? How do attorneys, are they expected to manage their own time? Do they have a clock? Well, everyone is expected to manage their own time. Even when they came in person, uh, timing is completely on them. Of course, when they were in the courtroom, we had the timer, the lights that tells them, you know, you got one minute remaining, time to stop. Um, for April, within half the clock. So it was the Chief Justice announcing, okay, you got one minute remaining or two minutes remaining, or, you know, your time has expired. For May, we adopted to display the clock on the screen. So as you argue the case, you can see the clock at the bottom of the screen. So that will tell you the actual time. But it's still up to the attorney to manage their own time, uh, including the rebuttal time. So they reserve time for rebuttal. So they need to understand that the first part of the argument will be the initial time that they requested. So they, yeah, they're responsible for managing their own time, but now for me and going forward, we have the clock that is displayed on the screen to facilitate the attorneys um, control their time. Oh, great. Uh, I, what, what is it that the justices see on their screen during the argument? The justices see uh, when they are in, in April, we have five members of the bench in the courtroom and two justices participate remotely. For May, we have justices on the bench. But what they see is actually the same display that the attorneys will see. They will see the same participants. So they will see all the members of the bench participating remotely on the screen, including the attorneys arguing for that specific case. Right. Uh, there seems to have been um, some very thoughtful exchanges. Uh, the counsel and the justices seem to be fully engaged, and um, I'm not noticing any um, diminution, di diminution in quality of argument. Uh, it, how is it for the court? Uh, what is your feedback from the court, or what is your uh, observation about the quality of arguments? Well, at the beginning, that was one of the concerns that we have. How is that going to work when it's time for us to ask questions? How are we going to be interacting with the attorneys? That was one of the main concerns that we had at the beginning. Uh, back in April, we observed that that actually was not really an issue because, I mean, people can actually hear when one of the justices is presenting a question. So the interaction between the members of the bench and the attorneys was 
I would say flawless. I mean, of course, sometimes you have to say, excuse me, um, so they can hear that you're talking. Uh, but actually, it has not been an issue. They've been able to interact with the attorneys just like they would do when they were in the courtroom in person. Right. Um, when it comes to uh, the sound level, echoes, feedback, muting, uh, is there anything that uh, you can recommend to attorneys to help with the sound quality? Uh, I know you run a test and get lots of technical support, but this advice might even apply when they're arguing in other courts remotely. Well, actually, we, when we do the test session, that's exactly what we're looking for. We want to make sure that we uh, solve any issues they may, may be having, including the echo, um, any feedback that they might get or that we might get from them. Uh, so that is the time that we're actually trying to resolve all the issues that we're dealing with. Um, so once we go through that, we kind of resolve either the microphone levels or they're too close to maybe another device or they may have the cell phone too close to the computer. So we go through all those uh, scenarios with them to make sure that we avoid having those issues while they're arguing the case. So perhaps for the court that doesn't have that sort of um, capacity to provide support, practitioners could run tests with each other remotely and test their sound equipment that way. Um, but generally, would you say uh, to mute oneself during argument and um, do you think it's better? Well, we have someone. Well, we we have someone controlling the the session for everyone. So when they're arguing one case, all the other members of the other cases, the attorneys for the second, the third case, let's say in the morning, since we have three cases, they'll be muted by our control for from our IT person. So they'll be muted. So the only people who will have the microphones on and the video will be the attorneys presenting arguments for that specific case and the justices. That eliminates any other feedback we might get from the other members. The moment the case is submitted, the attorneys are just presenting an argument, the video and the audio will be muted, and attorneys for the second case will be unmuted for video and audio, and they will come on the screen. Uh, that kind of helps resolve any issues with echo or feedback. Um, and by, the attorneys can control still the microphone level on their computers. Uh, this last session, we have an attorney that actually used a headset. A uh, headset did not provide any issues for us. I actually made it very clear to hear the attorney what they were arguing. So even if, even if you don't have a headset, just using the computer microphone and the speaker, that's more than enough, and that's been working fine. Okay, that's great. Um, do you think that this experience has opened up the possibility for more remote participation in the future, um, even when in-person arguments are possible again? Uh, that has not been discussed yet, and so I will not be able to provide any information. I mean, the court is very uh, pleased with the results in the first two oral argument sessions. We receive a lot of positive uh, feedback from the public and the attorneys that participated. Uh, we made some adjustments from the first session to the second session. One of the feedback that we received uh, that the view of the bench was too small. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, we made some enhancements to actually provide the same resolution for the members of the bench mm -hmm. that were in the courtroom. So that way that eliminated the small view of the courtroom. So we've been making enhancements based on the feedback that we get from the attorneys that were arguing cases. Uh, so we receive a lot of good feedback and reports as to the oral argument experience, uh, but that's where we are right now. No discussions have been taking place in regards to as to where we're going with this or if this is going to change the way we do oral arguments. That's not something we has been entertained by the court. Yeah, it's, I think it's a time for us all to be making observations and discussing it and thinking about the future. For, our, for the part of our committee, our committee on appellate courts, it's something we've talked about and um, you know, many would be very, very sad to ever lose the experience of that in-person opportunity to connect with the justices and, and attempt to persuade them. And then on the other hand, uh, for uh, two members of our committee who have physical disabilities, uh, it's been really wonderful to um, be able to have remote arguments without the difficulties of travel and access. So um, 
perhaps there'll be a solution, a hybrid of options that will uh, uh, that we'll all uh, improve arguments going forward as a result of this difficult experience. But um, I want to ask you before we conclude, uh, is there any other parting thoughts or advice you have to attorneys uh, who will be appearing before the court uh, remotely? All I can tell them is do not be afraid to ask questions from us. I mean, the moment the case is set on calendar, you can always email me with any concerns you may have or questions you may have. We've been addressing any questions or concerns they attorneys have, uh, either technical or just um, experience, uh, so we can provide some information to them. So the main thing is just to don't be afraid to ask the questions and then when we're running the test that is the time to really go through all the different scenarios you may encounter uh one of the th things that we have encountered is like what happens one of the questions is what happens if i'm arguing a case and something happens to my computer the video goes out the speaker we always provide a number that they can call in to continue the arguments of course if that video goes down. We also provide a phone number to them to send us that text if they have an issue so we can have one of our IT people try to fix that for them remotely. So we do have people standing by as they present arguments to try to resolve issues they may be having at the time they present arguments. That has not been the case. Actually, the last two sessions have been really going good. We haven't received any text from anyone with issues during oral argument, but we do provide that as well as a, as a means for them to feel that we have someone standing by to support them if the time comes for it or a need comes for them to have support from us. Well, I, speaking on behalf of the California Lawyers Association, it is very much appreciated. The support, the accessibility of your office in the court during this time has been um, really um, exemplary and uh, very reassuring. Uh, everything from uh, Chief Justice Kanchil Sakoye modeling mask wearing um, comfortably during the arguments, uh, your own ability to make these arguments run smoothly, never missing a mark, uh, it's all appreciated. And uh, although I know you told me offline that it's been a lot of work, uh, teamwork, I'm sure it has, but I think also very much tribute to your leadership and. Um, when Frank McGuire retired and uh, described you as a successor as being an excellent choice because of your common sense, your institutional knowledge and your tireless dedication. Uh, I think your true colors are showing during this crisis. And I want you to know that we appreciate it very, very much. Thank you for your time today, Mr. Navarro. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, and look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.